There it is, episode 10, Inside the Thin Blue Line. We're still doing it, and I think we can agree that this show, which talks about the inside world of uh, police and the, and the cop in the street, I think we can agree, Dale Lawrence, that this just gets better and better. Am I right about that? There's a lot of stuff going on. People just don't know the inside of what 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 cops do. So if, if you're on that defund the police <laughs> bandwagon, you're you might want to think twice. Hold on. Before we get to that, I know, <laughs> I know we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, but uh, I want to just mention to my right. Uh, joining us again after being out for a couple of weeks because uh, contract issues contract issues he was trying to find more money and a and he wanted a uh, later wake up time nathan arroyo <laughs> nathan how are you um terrific dave great it's great to have your your energy <laughs> here next to me <laughs> as always I, I if i didn't say it my name is dave radigan uh and we should say this dale lawrence is a fake name it's a pseudonym not his real name to protect the innocent or the guilty in this case. I don't know. Hard to say. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about scams. We're going to get back to what we talked about last episode and, and uh, talk a little this bit more. There's just so many. Uh, Dave, you could talk about this for weeks and months. Yeah. Oh, I think we could. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's frightening because uh, there's... There's just not enough enforcement, and there. Are, I don't know what the case, the the percentage of cases versus reported cases versus cases. Um, yeah, people don't report because they're embarrassed. Yeah, and, the, and there's not enough cops. We 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 very very rarely in, go through a thorough investigation. Yeah. We usually just look at the person and say, "How much did they take from you? Five hundred. Well, the lady just left yesterday. They took ten thousand. Yeah. So yeah, there's not much we can do for you. It's it's awful, and. Um, you know, it's funny, years ago, I did a story about lawyers, and a lot of these small firm lawyers who are the one, one person shop, um, there were cases where they would have money stolen from the escrow accounts, and no lawyer wanted that kind of publicity. So frequently, you know, the trusted employee would steal, and the lawyer would find out about it. By the time they found out about it, um, the question is, do you want to risk the bad publicity? Or do you want to just let it go? And a lot of lawyers let it go because it, you, would you trust somebody with your funds if you knew that they had previously lost oh, them? Absolutely not. That's a story for a whole, that's a whole nother podcast with a, yeah. I did a case with a lawyer who kept on um, taking money out of the, out of the fund of these uh, elderly people that one of their Ooh. elderly siblings died. And there was three of them fighting over three or $400,000. Uh, and guess who got all the money? Oh, the lawyer oh, got all the money. Oh, good for him. Yeah. That's awful. <laughs> no, really good for him. Good for him. They're old. What the fuck are they going to do with it? Uh, what do old people do? Well, they've got a bury. They need funerals. They need I mean, the, fu- the funeral business is a fucking scam. Throw them in a box. All right. Like I like that's all. <laughs> <laughs> fucking dig yourself a hole. Give back to the planet. Let the maggots eat you. <laughs> they need it more than you. Why spend fifteen million dollars on a nice little casket and a suit? Why get buried in a suit? That's a waste of a nice suit. What about what about <laughs> passing their uh, their riches down to their children who might be currently twenty two years old? Eh, fuck them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> eh, fuck them. Plant's gonna explode in like thirty years. Fuck them. Wow, that's very fatalistic. We'll um, we'll have to get back to the bigger issue. We'll, we'll talk about the lawyers in the future because I I I yeah we'll talk about that in the future. Uh, we'll talk about other types of scams in this episode, but also we've got a couple of things in the news that we want to cover. And one is out of Columbus, Ohio, and it's a pilot program. I guess there are some others around the country, but uh, Dale, tell me about that one. Yeah, so we talked about this in a few episodes prior about police officers dealing with mental health calls, which is a very big majority of what they what they uh, deal with on a daily basis. And there's some um, advocates out there who believe that cops aren't always best suited to deal with certain mental health calls. So out in Columbus, Ohio, they've been running a program probably for the last six weeks, and they dealt with probably right around 54 mental health calls. It's, it's a social worker, a mental health trained either paramedic or EMT, emergency medical technician, and then a 911 dispatcher. And that's kind of the, the most important person in this chain because they're going to have to decipher what is going to be a police response 
mental health. Maybe someone threatening suicide or threatening to harm someone or someone locked in their room with a weapon or a gallon of gasoline willing to pour it over their head. True story. Um, or they're going to send social workers. So that's the most important person in this link. And I guess so far what they're saying in Columbus, Ohio, is out of the 54 calls, things are going pretty good. And then I'm, I, I, uh, I'm probably a pretty big supporter of sending social workers on some of those calls. However, my true gut instinct is that as, this, as these programs start to pop up in other communities throughout the country, I think what you're going to have is you're going to have some situations that are going to spiral out of control and you're going to have these not so well tactically trained mental health responders getting injured if not killed on right. these calls. Because they're very unpredictable, very dangerous calls. A man who's off his meds acting a little irrational, five minutes later could be a man armed with a knife threatening to kill himself right. and anyone else. It, it can spiral out of control that quickly. And, and it's it seems like the key with this program and its success is the triage, deciding which are the appropriate calls to make. But as you say, sometimes you don't know. You just you, you just don't, don't know, know, and I think it's a good idea, and I think in theory it may work, or they think it's going to work, but law enforcement, academic people are not good cops. Street cops can sniff out certain situations. They can tell by the tone of the voice of a call. They can tell by the location, a, a known address, a known person. They can tell by the temperament of someone's voice on the phone, how things are going. Mm -hmm. You don't get that from social workers, and you don't get that from from necessarily dispatchers who aren't cops. That's a whole another aspect of law enforcement that's up for debate. But like, I'll, I'll repeat this. My gut is... People are going to get injured that don't need to be injured. However, I think it's worth a shot. Okay. Why wouldn't they take veteran cops, that guy who might have trouble running the, running the 10 yard dash, <laughs> or, you know, that guy or woman? Uh, why wouldn't they take that person and make him a dispatcher? I mean, I know that's the way it, it's. I mean, do they do that with these calls? Yeah, well, every, every department's different. Some really big departments have civilian dispatches. Mm -hmm. Say Boston or Worcester or New York City. They'll have civilians. They'll have a few cops sprinkled in there, here and there. But for the most part, large communities have civilian dispatches. And some of them are good, whereas others aren't. Mm -hmm. Smaller communities, little homey communities, they usually have cops. Other dispatches, and they, and they do a great job. It all mm -hmm. every, There's no right or wrong it's what works for the community what works for the department but most cops will probably err on the side of i'd rather have a cop sending me to a call than a dispatcher who's not a cop or not or doesn't have a law enforcement background okay if you pulled a bunch of cops most cops would say that right right because they just rather. know the street they, they know the dynamics of what's going on out there they know the dynamics of a call and they can kind of you can you can sense on a call, a 911 call, or just a, a call into the station, you can sense when people are being upfront with you or when they're trying to be evasive. And sometimes they're being evasive for a certain reason, and you don't want to send a social worker out to those calls because it's not going to turn out well, usually. Okay. All right, let's go to the next, uh, the next story. This is a pro-vigilante story. I don't know if it's pro, but it's certainly positive. Right up Nate's alley. Nate would be the first kid out of the house if this was happening. Nathan, you ever think about this? You mm -hmm. ever think about uh, mm -hmm. donning some sort of a costume and going out to fight crime? Fuck no. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this, uh, this person in southwest Portland, Oregon, uh, had uh, fired more than two dozen rounds at an apartment building and... Um, they said he shot Oregon again. Right? We didn't. We yeah. had Oregon last week. Yeah, Did, shithole. Oh, come on now. <laughs> come on. It's a beautiful state. It's a wonderful place. Uh, shooting incident saw twenty nine bullets fly before witnesses subdued and beat up the suspect. Uh, and the the suspect was the only person injured after he got beat up by witnesses. Uh, a neighbor snuck up on the gunman and knocked him out before others helped tie him up, according to the Portland Police Bureau. 
uh, 32-year-old man allegedly fired more than two dozen rounds indiscriminately in an occupied apartment building in southwest Portland at around 1 a.m. on June 29th, according to an arrest affidavit. No one was injured except for uh, the, the guy's name is Stelarczyk. Um, Luke Stelarczyk, easy for you to say. Uh, but after witnesses, quote, disarmed and detained him, a booking photo shows, <laughs> shows the man with two black eyes and other facial bruising. So it sounds like this guy got, uh, got a little hey, beating. He got what he deserved. And, and I think uh, hats off to the people in that community because the response time, I don't know what the response time is for that area, but three, four, five minute response time, guy with an automatic weapon, What's a, what's a good what's a good response time? Oh boy, that, that's hot. I mean, I, it, it's all in, in a small community, 30, 40,000 people with five or six cops on the street. I think a good response time is probably a minute and a half to two minutes. Minute and a half, two minutes, and for a bigger, in, 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 bigger? In, in a big community, it all depends on the crime. The, the well, shots fired, I would think they would fired, come right away. Right, but in New York City, could be five oh. minutes with traffic. Boston, oh. five minutes. It all depends. Yeah, a lot of these a lot of these departments are down on manpower. Some calls don't even get a response. I mean, obviously, acts of violence with weapons and domestic violence and stuff like that will get a response, but it, it, yeah, it, it's all relative to what's going on and how many cops are on the street. How long would it take to fire 29 shots? With an automatic with a, weapon? Yeah. Less 10 seconds? Okay. 15 seconds? So he made a joke and blah, 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 So those, those people in the community, they, they stood up for their own safety and they did the right thing and hats off to them. Um, oh, He's wait a minute, right? Hats well, off? Yeah, sure, they did. A small community of dipshits can do their can do a cop's job better than a fucking cop. <laughs> <laughs> cops are going to take 25 fucking minutes to get there, and when they get there, they're going to be like, okay, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Okay, okay, can you show us where the door is so we can get in there? Uh, maybe we can talk to this guy. Fucking, fucking, fucking Darlene from apartment B12 is going to go in there with a rolling pin and just take the sucker out. These cops. While the, <laughs> while the cops are out there still waiting, just like, oh, do you show me the big <laughs> go see the cafe, my twee. These cops in Poland have really, ti- really he's, tiny you know, mouths. He's, 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 he's right. He's fifty percent right. He's fifty percent right. Fifty percent right. He's I correct. Say, I'd say he's always fifty percent right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, the guy had an AR-15. Is that is that automatic or is that semi? Are you from? Well, yeah, an AR-15 is, is a military weapon. It. It's going to be a semi-automatic unless he's a weapons expert and he made it automatic. Oh, okay. You've got to you've got to alter him, right? You'd have to alter it. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's an, it's an assault all, rifle. He, he, that's what we've all learned from. Uh, oh, an assault AR assault rifle. Assault rifle. Fifteen. And we've all learned how you can modify by watching uh, all the school shootings, which went went went, went away for the year, and then it came back. Oh, uh, yeah, don't, the yeah, year, don't have to worry about those anymore. Well, now yeah, that, yeah, no, now you that, don't. Yeah, I know. And you're all laying in wait. Um, so you've had that, or I don't know, have you had that happen or did you tell me, or you know, you know, of yeah, cases no, I, where, I've, you know, there are people out there, regardless of the current climate in law enforcement, there are people out there that will come to the aid of a cop in trouble or that'll come to the aid of people in trouble. My own experience is we had a, we had a car accident one day, an ex-con gets into a car accident it's a car, cops show up, he gets out, big dude, ex-con, starts fighting with the cops. Cops are having a hard time. How many cops? Two. Two cops, one one guy. One, <laughs> one criminal, a very large one, criminal. Okay. Um, so what happens is a local kid from the community ha- had a sh- local shop. He knew the cops. Everyone, so he got into a little trouble once in a while, went nothing crazy. He pulled right over and jumped out and helped the cops uh, handcuff the kid. That's that's helpful. Yep, it's same helpful. thing. I was I, when I worked. I worked at a job and as a cop early on in my career. And <clears throat> there was a couple of kids giving me a hard time, and people in the community saw it and they ran out of their house. A couple of young kids ran out of their house and started um, 
laying the fist to the two kids that were giving me up. <laughs> they, really? Yeah. So you didn't do anything, and, and you let these guys jump these kids from behind? Is well, they, 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 it was two-on-one with me, and a couple of kids were on the porch, and they saw what was happening, and they said, hey, I, I know that cop. So, so by, by saying they were giving you a hard time, do you mean that they were? They were, they were kind of getting physically aggressive toward me. It, was just, it would have been a matter of time that, that it would have been a, 